and we're going to move on. Now you will notice that we have the same quote-unquote memory verse from last time because we're going to be talking more. And um, before we get started, though, let's start with prayer for our lesson and the things. We have good things to, to consider this morning. So if you're able, would you kneel with me? Father, we are thankful for this Sabbath morning here in West Virginia and for those who have joined us. And I noticed that some are missing. Now, I know this is summertime. People can be on the road, as Pastor is. Um, but we pray for those who have joined us, as well as our regular people who may not uh, be able to be with us for whatever reason. Please bless each one. And as we open your word, Give us your spirit to teach and guide us. May all go according to your will. And we cherish truth, Lord, so teach us this morning. May our worship be one with the worship in heaven, I ask. And whatever concern might be on the hearts of those who are listening, I ask, Father, that you will comfort them. You will speak to their hearts and direct them in whatever um decision or uh, worry or um, a problem that they're faced with. So help us, Lord. We need you. And we're so thankful that we can call you our Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, we're going to focus this morning on the thrones of worship. I have 1 Kings 12, 2 Chronicles 13 still there. But as I reviewed those verses, I realized we've already read them and talked about them. So I'm going to focus now, before we get into Elijah, hopefully next week we will be able to start a lesson on Elijah. But I want to um, draw together uh, Jeroboam, Rehoboam, and thrones of worship. So I'm going to open now our lesson study entitled Thrones of Worship. There we go. First thing I want to do is introduce you to Charles M. Snow. Maybe you already know him. He was born in 1868, died 1933, but he was born in Bridgewater, Maine. And I think about our, our brothers up in Maine, and I used to live in Maine uh, for a number of years. And uh, so Maine is very dear to my heart. He was born in Bridgewater, Maine, which is way up north in Aroostook County. And at the time... Uh, he was one or two years old. The census for that little town was 605. Uh, as he uh, grew and became aware of our great message, the second Advent message, the message of uh, uh, following the great disappointment and the work in heaven, he accepted this message and became assistant editor at Signs of the Times, then associate editor at Review and Herald, then associate editor of the Liberty Magazine, and finally its editor-in-chief. He was an ordained minister, a member of the Sabbath School Department Committee, a member of the Religious Liberty Bureau Committee of the GC, and he authored two, at least two books. One was entitled Liberty in America, and the second one is entitled On the Throne of Sin. And then he uh, went to the Australasian Division and uh, did the same duties there that he had done here in North America. He was on um, editor of Signs of the Times and Life and Health magazine. You may be familiar, if you've been in the Adventist um, uh, denomination, you know about Life and Health magazine. And he composed hymns and poems. <clears throat> this is Charles M. Snow. And the next three slides I'm going to read to you are his writing. So let's uh, look at the next slide. There sits today on the throne of sin 
one who has grown old in evil, cunning in subtlety, and cruel in deceit. He has waged war in heaven and on earth. He filled heaven with discord and earth with death and both with sorrow. He challenged every purpose of God and coveted the throne of the eternal, planning to rule the universe or plunge it into chaos and ruin. That conflict, older than man, explains the presence of every conflict that disturbs our race today. Every pestilence that afflicts afflicts humanity, every sorrow and pain and death that tortures the children of earth, Lucifer, the one-time covering cherub of heaven, is the Satan of our smitten world, the demon leader of the hosts of darkness that oppose in this world every purpose of God and the Savior of man. The throne of sin, he says is no figure of speech, and the occupant of that throne is no figment of the imagination. Jesus Christ called him the prince of this world, John 14.30. The apostle Peter describes him as the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, Ephesians 2.2. 2. John the Revelator designated him as the great dragon, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, Revelation 12, 9. And, and those are the first few paragraphs of chapter 1 of the book he wrote entitled On the Throne of Sin. Now, we know God established a system of worship for the Israelites of old. It was a tabernacle in the wilderness. And this is what the way God instructed his people to worship him. Well, but our lesson today is focusing on thrones of worship. Now, you may have noticed on the program agenda, Sabbath school agenda, we had texts from um, Kings and Chronicles but we've already read them, so we're going to go straight into our lesson. And the first thing I want to do is introduce you to Charles M. Snow, born in 1868 in Bridgewater, Maine. For those of you who live in Maine, I put this in just for you. And I used to live in Maine, so I have a, a, a strong affinity for Maine. And Bridgewater is in Aroostook County, way up north. And the census when he was one or two years old was 605 people. So it's a small little town where he was born. After he became part of um, the Seventh-day Adventist faith, he became assistant editor at Signs of the Times, associate editor at the Review and Herald, associate editor, then chief editor, of the Liberty Magazine. He was an ordained minister of the Adventist faith, a member of um, the Sabbath School Department Committee, a member of the Religious Liberty Bureau Committee of the GC, and he authored two books that I'm aware of. One was entitled Liberty in America and the second On the Throne of Sin. And the reason I bring that out is I tried to find information about Brother Snow, Elder Snow, and the few places I was able to read about him, they all mentioned his use of words and his ability to express himself well. He composed hymns and poems, for example. <clears throat> and he, he and his family moved to the Australasian division and um, took up duties similar to what he had um, done for us in North America, such as editing the Signs of the Times and the uh, life, uh, life, and life and Health magazine. Up into Maine. Oh, well, Miss Lily, very good. So I don't know about you, but I fell in love with Maine by living up there. But we're going to now read some of Brother Snow's words and see how they fit into our lesson today. 
there sits today on the throne of sin, one who has grown old in evil, cunning in subtlety, and cruel in deceit. He has waged war in heaven and on earth. He filled heaven with discord, and earth with death, and both with sorrow. He challenged every purpose of God and coveted the throne of the Eternal, planning to rule the universe or plunge it into chaos and ruin. That conflict, older than man, explains the presence of every conflict that disturbs our race today, every pestilence that afflicts humanity, every sorrow and pain and death that tortures the children of earth. Lucifer, the one-time covering cherub of heaven, is Satan, the Satan of our smitten world, the demon leader of the hosts of darkness that oppose in this world every purpose of God and the Savior of men. The throne of sin is no figure of speech, and the occupant of that throne is no figment of the imagination. Jesus Christ called him the prince of this world, John 14.30. The apostle Paul describes him as the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, Ephesians 2.2, 2. John the Revelator designated him as the great dragon, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, Revelation 12.9. And those are the first few paragraphs of chapter 1 of this book entitled, On the Throne of Sin. Now, Jesus, um, God, gave us, the Israelites, I should say, uh, of uh, years ago, centuries, millennia ago, a system of worship involving a tabernacle in the wilderness. But when Jeroboam took office, took his throne of the northern ten tribes of Israel, he established what Ellen White calls a new form of worship or a strange form of worship in the northern city of Dan, in the southern city of Bethel. And part of that worship, that abominable worship, was the worship of the golden calf, or actually uh, a young bullock, a yearling bullock. And um, Ellen White tells us in Prophets and Kings 99.2 that Jeroboam's greatest fear was that at some future time the hearts of his subjects might be won over by the ruler occupying, i.e. Rehoboam, the throne of a David. He was afraid he was going to lose his throne. And so, to um, prevent this, he established this strange form of worship. Prophets and Kings 100. In arranging this transfer, of worship that God, I, I'm speaking now, the worship that God had established into the worship, this new form of worship he was establishing. So going back, in arranging this transfer, Jeroboam thought to appeal to the imagination of the Israelites by setting before them some visible representation to symbolize the presence of the invisible God. Now, I just want to stop there and remind you about the sanctuary in the wilderness. The people never saw anything inside the uh, sanctuary. The priests went in to the holy place, the high priest into the most holy place once a year, but the common person came into the outer court only and brought his sacrifice. He didn't see the candlesticks, the table of incense, that I'm aware of, unless the curtains were open, I suppose. But oh, but he, they, he never, he, she never went in to the holy place. Only the Levites, the priests, did that. But here, Jer Jeroboam uh, was 
setting up something they could see. He realized that if he involved the visual as well as the um, uh, what they heard, there is music, et cetera, involved in this worship, that this would um, capture the imagination of the people. And so he set up these two bulls. Now, last time I think I said when at the excavations at Dan, there was no way of knowing whether the high place that they went up to was enclosed or not. We just couldn't tell if from the excavations if there was a um, if it was open air or enclosed. But Ellen White tells us here, Prophets and Kings, a hundred point one. Going on, we read, accordingly, Jeroboam, uh, caused to be made two calves of gold, and these were placed within shrines at the appointed centers of worship. In this effort to represent the deity, Jeroboam violated the plain command of Jehovah, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. Prophets and Kings 87 this time. The Lord, through his messenger, had spoken plainly to Jeroboam. Now, this was at the time when Solomon was still living, and uh, God sent his messenger to Jeroboam to tell him that he had been chosen to um, lead uh, the ten tribes of Israel. Anyway, so, the Lord, through his messenger, had spoken plainly to Jeroboam regarding the necessity of dividing the kingdom. Now, I just want to stop there for a moment. Uh, I've been thinking uh, this week, or especially yesterday as I was reviewing our lesson, about um, you and me. Because if you're like me, you were put out of the church because of the non-Trinitarian beliefs that I had and had uh, spoken up just briefly in one Sabbath school class, but that was the end of that, you see, and I was gone. But so, but maybe you have voluntarily chosen to lead the denomination because of the untruths that are um, being proclaimed by them. Regardless, um, whether you're put out or you've left, the main focus of my thought is, is it God's will to leave or do we stay? And that's a question many people have had to uh, consider for themselves. And here I'm looking at this united kingdom. And Ellen White tells us that the ten tribes rebelled against Rehoboam. They rebelled, and they walked away and left and proclaimed Jeroboam their king. So they left what God had established as the, the uh, nation of Israel, so to speak. And, uh, and did they do wrong to do that? Because rebellion is how they were described. They rebelled. But here in Prophets and Kings 87.4, we read that God said this was necessary. It was necessary to divide the kingdom. Going on, we read, this division must take place. And then he gives the reason, and it's in Scripture, too, that we've read. And it's, quote, this division must take place, he had declared, quote, because they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, Chemish, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the children of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do that which is right in mine eyes, and to keep my statutes and my judgments, as did David. So it was necessary at the time of the United Kingdom and when we think of today, are we walking away from what God has established? Are we doing wrong in doing this? God said it was necessary in the time of the Israelites because they had forsaken him. And so today, 
if we decide to leave the denomination, it's not because we're rebelling against it, but because they have forsaken those great truths and principles that were given to this denomination early on, and I'll talk about that later. But I just wanted to bring that thought in now, because some people may be on the fence, like um, the ship is going through, for example, and I meant to get your references. Pastor's written about that. I, I've written some about that, that you could read more about this if you're sitting on the fence. Do I stay? Do I leave? Um, but here is an example where God said it was necessary for them to um, divide. The, it was necessary for the kingdom to be divided because they had forsaken God. Going on. Next slide. 18, 297.1. Let none seek to tear away the foundations of our faith, the foundations that were laid at the beginning of our work by prayerful study of the word and by revelation. Upon these foundations we have been building for the last 50 years. Men may suppose that they have found a new way and that they can lay a stronger foundation. And stopping there, we have men in the 50s who uh, worked with um, Barnhouse uh, so that we wouldn't be uh, labeled as a um, cult. And the way we avoided that label was to lay a new way, a, a stronger, so, i.e., I mean, quote, unquote, stronger platform of truth, which was Trinitarian and agreed with the rest of the evangelical world. And so going back here, A.T., I should have gotten the date of this um, writing, but I didn't. I'm sorry. But she says, men may suppose that they have found a new way and that they can lay a stronger foundation than that which has been laid. But this is a great deception. Other foundation can no man lay that than that which has been laid. And then Review and Herald, uh, June 13, 1871, page 204, that uh, our brother Robert in Ireland shared with us last time states, James White is speaking, we invite all to compare the testimonies of the Holy Spirit through Mrs. White with the word of God, dot, dot, dot. I'm leaving some out for... for um, a spacing, the Trinitarian may compare them with his creed, i.e. may compare um, the testimonies of Ellen White with his creed, and because they do not agree with it, condemn them. The observer of Sunday, or the man who holds eternal torment and important truth, and the minister that sprinkles infants may each condemn the testimonies of Mrs. W, because they do not agree with their peculiar views. And so here we have this statement, 1871, that Ellen White was non-Trinitarian, because the Trinitarian would read her things and not agree with it. Going on. Now, uh, we're going to skip uh, a few kings here in Prophets and Kings 322.1 and read, the accession of Ahaz to the throne brought Isaiah and his associates face to face with conditions more appalling than any that hitherto that had hitherto existed in the realm of Judah. Many who had formerly withstood the seductive influence of idolatrous practices were now being persuaded to take part in the worship he of heathen deities. Princes in Israel were proving untrue to their trust. False prophets were arising with messages to lead astray. Even some of the priests were teaching for hire. Yet the leaders in apostasy still kept up the forms of divine worship and claimed to be numbered among the people of God. <clears throat> now, 
Uh, maybe this would be a good time for me to interrupt our lesson and bring in a short little lesson that I had last time, just a few slides, four slides, about Gobohar Hariwaji. And I've titled it A New Order of Thinking. Now, we, we are trying to finish up this new form of worship that Jeroboam was establishing in Dan and Bethel, a strange form of worship. Um, and, and here, Gobahar Hadawaji was exposed to a new order or a new form, a strange form of thinking. Let me tell you a little bit about her. Gobahar endured hours, hundreds of hours of brainwashing She's living today in France, and she's written a book entitled How I Survived a Chinese Re-Education Camp. And in the preface, another person wrote, Gobahar endured hundreds of hours of brainwashing and other abusive treatment because her daughter had attended a Uyghur demonstration in Paris. China sentenced Gobahar to seven years in a re-education camp. Her trial did not take place until after a year in detention. It lasted nine minutes. No judge or lawyers were present. A police official sentenced her to these seven years. But backing up, she was born into a Sunni Muslim Uyghur family that had lived in Xinjiang for generations. Now, Xinjiang is on the um, western end of China where the Uyghurs are. Now, that's spelled U-Y-G-H-U-R, just in case you're wondering who I'm speaking of, of whom I am speaking. Um, these are the Muslims and uh, of that area. And communist China is not tolerating uh, their beliefs because everyone has to think the same in communist China. Everyone has to have the same goals, the same support of the of, of the government, and there's no um, wiggle worm room. Sorry, wiggle room to, for any dissident thinking, and they look at the Muslims as dissidents, and either they're going to be reeducated and become thorough communist Chinese people, or they're going to be exterminated. And many of them had been put to death. And she was one of them that faced part of this um, uh, treatment. China was able, in like Xinjiang, Xinjiang, China was able to surveil and control Xinjiang through armies of cameras that they had posted all through the city that had facial recognition and through police presence on every street corner and through these transformation through education camps. Gobahar had never had any interest in politics. She considered herself a peaceful Islamist. But the situation in Xinjiang and in her husband husband's and her work environments escalated to the point that she and her family moved to France as exiles. Now, they were um, um, being mistreated in the work environment. Uh, they were um, being treated in a racist way, so they left. However, once they got there, after living there for several years, Gobahar received a call from her former employer. She was an engineer in a company. And this um, former employer told her she was, uh, the time had come for her to receive her pension from this company, but she needed to come back to China to sign the forms in order to get the pension. She tried to have someone sign for her, but they said, no, you have to be here in person. And so she went back trusting. As soon as she arrived, her passport was confiscated and she was jailed. And after months in jail, she was transferred to a camp and the process of re-education was begun. Now, um, and, and that's all of my slides, but I just want to tell you that the way they changed her thinking 
and they did change your thinking. And brothers and sisters, we're looking at a very near future of our thinking um, to be radical and uh, in need of change. Now, it may not be accomplished or tried to be accomplished in the same way China is working against the Uyghurs, but um, we will be faced with this um, pressure to change our way of thinking or die. There will be a death decree. And uh, uh, it's very possible that there may not be re-education camps here in America. I don't know. You may know. But I do know that pressure, most, um, the most convincing and the heaviest pressure that can be brought against a person is from believers, like believers, supposedly like believers, or family members and loved ones, you see, that can say, You've got to change just a little bit, or you're going to die. That kind of pressure will be brought against us. Uh, possibly, you know, I, I can't see into the future uh, other than what has been revealed to us through the spirit of prophecy and through the scriptures. We have these blessed truths that are precious, and we need to understand. God has revealed them to us for a purpose. And um, so here we are um, facing a future similar to what Gubahar faced. And she was fatigued. She went to classes, i.e. class, um, quote unquote classes, uh, for 12 hours a day, having to memorize the communist dogma, having to hear it repeated over and over, hour after hour, hearing this, these things, being interrogated and being told, you have done a crime because your daughter was seen at a demonstration in France. You have, uh, you were a criminal. And uh, she would say in the interrogation, I have done nothing wrong. I have not done the things you said I've done. I am a peaceful person, etc. Over and over, she would reply to these uh, accusations by the interrogus, um, interrogators. And um, we may be in a similar situation. But she was fatigued. She repetitiously heard, heard, reheard, reheard, reheard these errors had to repeat them over so that her brain, her thinking was slowly being changed in, and then her interrogator changed to a very smooth, polished, and she said in her book, someone she could tell was high up in the chain of command. And under the pressure he applied, she changed. She agreed that he was right. She was willing to go on TV, on video, uh, to be um, to say that she was this criminal. She had done these bad things. What the uh, Chinese people are saying is true. And because she did that, she caved in. They brought her out of the um, prison she was in, or the camp, I should say. There's a difference. You could have been sent to prison or sent to these re-education re camps, and she was sent to a camp. And she was retrieved from that camp, put un under house arrest, was allowed to see her family under controlled conditions, of course, because she had recanted, and because now she was espousing the communist line. Uh, she eventually was um, released from house arrest, and eventually made her way back to her family in France. But this was the way they changed her thinking. And we have a truth that knows of no error. We cannot change our thinking and accept um, this strange form, this uh, form of doctrine, that was not part of what God gave us and was not part of what Ellen White, James White, the pioneers preached and wrote and printed. 
We cannot change. Otherwise, we will like be like Gubahar. And see, they always have, if she should ever say, I was coerced, I was forced, or they were wrong, uh, I, I retract my confession, so to speak, they have um, the evidence against her. So let's now go back to our lesson where we left off. Um, and, and this is slide 13. Pro again, Prophets and Kings 3.22. Early on we read, Many who had formerly withstood the seductive influence of idolatrous practices were now being persuaded to take part in the worship of heathen deities. If we are are slowly weaned away from this truth and can take part in the worship, remember we're talking about worship, of the Trinity, that's idolatry, that's an abomination. And um, even though we might be keeping up the forms of worship, we are now worshiping, worshiping a strange God going on. Uh, Review and Herald, September 11, 1894. In Christ's day, the religious leaders had so long presented human ideas before the people that the teaching of Christ was in every way opposed to their theories and practice. His Sermon on the Mount virtually contradicted the doctrines of the self-righteous scribes and Pharisees, they had so misrepresented God that he was looked upon as a stern judge, incapable of compassion, mercy, and love going on. Though they professed to know and to worship the true and living God, they wholly misrepresented him and the character of God as represented by his Son, was an original subject, a new gift to the world. Christ had made every effort so to sweep away the misrepresentations of Satan that the confidence of man in the love of God might be restored. And this is the part that is touching now. He taught man to address the supreme ruler of the universe by the new name, our Father. This name signifies his true relation to us, and when spoken in sincerity by human lips, it is music to the ears of God. Christ leads us to the throne of God by a new and living way to present him to us in his paternal love. And, and so this Our Father, something new that Jesus taught the people. Now, another thought is, now Satan is going to attack the fathership of people because a godly father represents our Heavenly Father. So you can be sure, and we know it's true, we see it all the time, families are under attack, especially the fathers. Think about, think about everything that's in our world today that undermines, that distorts, that um, uh, not even, more than distorts, gives a false father to the world today. Satan is behind that going on. 6T366. The church of God below is one with the church of God above. Believers on the earth and the beings in heaven who have never fallen constitute one church. Every heavenly intelligence is interested in the assemblies of the saints. And it's true, we're not in one location with one roof over us. But nevertheless, you are an assembly where you're at. And she says, every heavenly intelligence is interested in the assemblies of the saints 
who on earth meet to worship God? In the inner court of heaven, they listen to the testimonies of the witnesses for Christ in the outer court on earth, and the praise and thanksgiving from the worshipers below is taken up in the heavenly anthem, and praise and rejoicing sound through the heavenly courts, because Christ has not died in vain for the fallen sons of Adam. Can't you say hallelujah and praise God? And so, they are all focused on Sabbath with our worship of our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ our Savior going on. Oh, that we could all realize the nearness of heaven to earth. And this is important what I'm going to read because uh, you may have loved ones who have turned their back on what they were taught, or who are not interested in heavenly things. But let me read to you 366.1. When the earth-born children know it not, they have angels of light as their companions. A silent witness guards every soul that lives, seeking to draw that soul to Christ. As long as there is hope, until men resist the Holy Spirit to their eternal ruin, they are guarded by heavenly intelligences. Now, your children, if you have children, may be grown, living on their own. You don't know everything that's happening in their lives as you did when they were young and you were raising them. You don't know what peril they might be in because they're running on tires that are threadbare. You may not know these things. But you can you pray for them, of course. But you can take comfort in that there is a silent witness that guards every soul that lives, and you can believe that's every soul, whether they're following God or not. Does it mean God can do as much for that person as he can for those who worship him in truth? But there is a guard placed upon that person, and I take comfort in that going on. Uh, manuscript 51, 1890, paragraph 30. What a work the angels have to perform in doing the bidding of Christ to minister unto all them who shall be heirs of salvation. In their ministration, they are constantly bringing light and strength from heaven to the souls who are striving for eternal life. That's you and me. But they are engaged in a warfare against satanic influences which are strong, fierce, and determined to overthrow every soul who loves and fears God. As these angels in their mission and work come to understand the plan of redemption, they marvel at the great change that takes place in human hearts. And that brackets is in the original, brothers and sisters. They marvel at the great change that takes place in human hearts and adore the Lord of all power and grace. With joy they read with joy they read the names of those whose names are registered in the book of life. And I believe each one of our names are registered there. They read this with joy going on. The conversion of the human soul is of no little consequence. It is the greatest miracle performed by divine power evangelism 289.2. And I put that here because you may have had people tell you or um, insinuate about you that oh, what you believe is just a figment of your imagination. And it's really not reality. How can you prove anything? And here is the proof, brothers and sisters. It's the conversion of the old selfish ways 
to God's beautiful ways of selflessness and of service. And um, the old ways of losing your temper, speaking wrong things, mistreating other people, taking advantage of other people, especially those in your home, or um, uh, denigrating other people, whatever it might be. Those old ways are gone. And they're gone not because of anything, any power we have is the power of God working in our lives. And um, we're working on old paths now, trying to, we will get it printed hopefully next week, but I'm going over articles, etc. And uh, Pastor has put in an article from Wagoner, E.J. Wagoner, um, that is, as I was reading it, and I have to make sure the spacing and everything is right. So I'm reading it critically for um, uh, copying, copy editing. But I'm also reading it for content. And there is an important section there that I'm just going to refer you to and see if you can find it. Because you may have wondered, how can Christ relate to me, an addict? for example. He was never addicted to anything. Or how can Christ relate to me as a woman with hormonal changes? He never had to experience any of that. Or how can he relate to anything that you can bring up? A sickness, for example. Christ was never sick. So how can he sympathize? How can he, how can he relate to me in those areas? We can understand appetite because, you know, he was 40 days in the wilderness. Um, there are certain things we can understand. We can understand how he had to face the um, insinuations and the uh, uh, condemnation of people around him because he experienced that. So we can understand, he can understand when we experience that. But some of these other things he didn't experience. Um, but Wagoner addresses that. And as I was reading that, I got a new insight. And I'll just leave it there um, for you to read later. Uh, but but we are working on, on this, and you may, on old paths, and, and going back to our lesson here, you may have experienced the finger pointing, the shaming, oh, the, the denigration of, oh, you believe in things that are just in your mind, and that's it. But this is the proof, brothers and sisters, when you um, put others first, when you care for others, when you provide for others to your own detriment even, or and we will be faced with that if we are ever in prison um, because food may be in short supply. And um, will you think of others before yourself? I remember a story I told probably more than once um, from Eric B. Hare when he was leaving Rangoon, was it? To, because World War II was encroaching upon, was it two? I think, no, it must have been World War I encroaching upon him uh, and his uh, conference churches and offices, they had to leave. And uh, water was in short supply. It was a great, great mass of people who left. And so food was in short supply, and there was pushing and shoving to get to the water but not with Brother Hare, and not with the other Christians. They waited in line and didn't. And see, they were white people compared with the natives. And so they were, um, most white people were used to going to the front of the line and pushing others out of the way, but not Brother Hare and not the Christians he was with. And other people noticed it, you see. There's a change in our behavior. We are no longer selfish, thinking of ourselves first and foremost. That is the biggest proof. Now, is it okay to want to be like the Most High? We know, let's see, we're running out of time. 
Uh, maybe I can cover this one section. Great Controversy 494. Thou hast said, dot, 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 I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Verse 6. Isaiah 14, 13, and 14. Instead of seeking to make God supreme in the affections and allegiance of his creatures, it was Lucifer's endeavor to win their service and homage to himself. He wanted to be like the Most High to get the homage, to get the uh, servitude of people going on. Uh, manuscript 113, 1899, paragraph 10. When we consider that our probation cost the life of God's only Son, we should cherish the highest principles of integrity, for we are to be like Christ in character. Ye must be born again, Christ says, or you will never see the kingdom of God. Um, Going on, we are to seek to be like Jesus, to reflect his image and imitate his example. Um, now, in our world today, we have people who seek to be great. Should we seek to be great? Well, there is Arthur Rubenstein, a great pianist. It took decades at the piano to make everything work well. He sought to be great. This is a lady who received the Nobel literature, uh, Nobel Prize for Literature. She sought to be great. Then we have athletes who seek to be great. Um, here's one of them. And the next one is the first lady mathematician to receive the Abel Prize in Mathematics, um, a, a very high prestigious award. It took hours, hours, Decades of study, of understanding, of um, seeking to be great in mathematics. Now, I can't say any of these people sought to be great um, for the um, uh, prestige. I don't know. I can't read their hearts. But are we to seek to be great? And yes, in a way, we are. We are to seek to be like God have the character of Christ, but not seeking it in the same way Lucifer sought to be like God. He wanted the prestige. He wanted to be in charge. He wanted everything for himself. But here's a, an important quote, and I'll have to close soon. Testimonies to Ministers 146.2. God holds us responsible for all that we might be if we would improve our talents, going on in a different reference, we may add to our talents by improving those we already have. The Lord expects us to gain knowledge, to increase our ability, and to improve our talents. But we can never do this if we allow our minds to be molded by worldly surroundings going on. Um, Review and Herald, December 1, 1896. Article A, paragraph 17. We may um, add to our talents by improving the ones we already have. I read that. The Lord expects us... Oh, this is a duplicate, sorry. We'll just move on. And we'll probably stop here. Special testimony to the Oakland and Battle Creek churches, page 15.1, written in 1897. Your mind, your soul, your strength, or all the Lord's. None of these talents will be left out by the Master in reckoning, in the reckoning that is soon to be made. We may leave them out of our reckoning, but the Lord measures with exactitude every possibility for service. He has a right to expect us to acquire other talents. The unused capabilities are just as mu much brought into account as those which we improve. Our talents only increase by faithful improvement of them. And so what I want to leave with you today, this morning, in this section, is, <clears throat> yes, we are to seek to be the best. 
but only for the glory of God. We are to seek our characters, um, to, imp to have a character of Christ. And may I remind you, brothers and sisters, when we talk about thrones, that we, one day, if we are faithful, will be kings and priests unto our God. And so we need to seek to be the best, but only um, through the power of God and to bring glory to God. It may not be his will to know, um, I don't know, all the intricacies of how to put flooring in, but it might be. But we need to do the best that is present uh, of the, make the best of the opportunities that are within our realm. Our talents need to be developed. He expects that, and when he judges that, he judges what we do, but also what we have failed to do because we chose not to. Okay, uh, I'm going to close. Let's close with prayer. Father, we're so thankful that we can call you Father and that you understand us. Help us to be faithful to all that you've given us. You've made each of us unique. You've given opportunities that are unique to each one of us. And none is a judge of another. But what we have in our little hand uh, to uh, use for your honor and glory, may it magnify, may we do the best and, Father, strengthen our minds against error, against persuasions, to return to the old ways, um, uh, old erroneous ways, I should say. Let us hold on to truth and love it and cherish it and realize it was bought with the price of our, our Savior's death on the cross. Thank you, Father, for giving us all that we need to be your son and your daughter. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Until we meet again, may God watch between us and bless you. One day we'll all meet around the throne of God, Lord willing. Bye for now. Here we are. We're ready to begin. And you will see that we have three things to accomplish in the time that we have allotted here. One is I put introduction. It's really not an introduction. It might feed into it, but it's just good information about guarding the old hands. Then I want to finish up thrones of worship because I couldn't, I couldn't, couldn't quit without considering God's throne. So we're going to finish that up, and we have to finish up the last part of the story we've had way back when, and, um, and then we will start with Elijah, Lord willing. But here's the thought to remember, and it's from Manuscript 189, 1905. They are the old hands that have helped with their means and with their physical strength and with their mental powers. And we want to say to you, let not your heart be troubled. And she continues on for the first three verses of John there, John 14. Let not your heart be troubled. She's speaking to these old hands. And then an ellipse, just so I could get it all here on our agenda. Now I want to say that I feel like guarding the old hands in the work. And now we're going to open up our presentation on the old hands. And here you have a picture. This is from Loma Linda, 1915. I'll explain more about it at um, what Elder Loughborough, I believe, ca called the Fall Council. It's called In the Minutes. I had to search and search for it to get the minutes, and I thought, oh, I'll never find them. I want What I wanted to know is, did this council 
happened before Ellen White's death or after it. And it's three months after it. Uh, you know, it was called fall. And and doesn't make sense that it was before, but I wanted to make sure. And so the, Ellen White died, 1915. I'll give you the date later. Three months later, this quote-unquote fall council was held at Loma Linda. And some, and, and this is a picture of some of the people that attended that fall council. And I could tell you who they are now, but I think the next slide tells us. It's in the minutes called a Biennial Council, Loma Linda, California, starting November 7, 1915, and seems to have continued through the 21st. Left to right seated are Haskell, Lothborough, and G.I. Butler, president, not at this time, of uh, the General Conference for many years. Standing behind them, left to right, J.H. Rogers, J.O. Corliss, H.W. Decker, and H.W. Cottrell. And Ellen White died in July, of course, July 16. So this happened um, about three months, this council about three months later. And here in this manuscript, I'm giving this paragraph to give you the context. And I want to say, Ellen White is speaking. Um, and in January, so this is, has nothing to do with the um, um, council in Loma Linda. I want to say that we want very much more of a union and connection with God. And if we have it, we will, shall be so moved by the Spirit of God that when we see the work and hear so much about it, we will go just as those disciples went. Christ said to them, leave your nets, leave your ships, and follow me. Now, they were not called to go to a place like Battle Creek and stay there five years to get ready. God is not in that business at all. He wants that everyone who has a knowledge of the truth should start out and go to work under some ministers if they have not the experience. They should go out among the people and go from house to house, going on. Now I see that Brother Corliss is looking very anxious. He would be glad to do all this work, but if God has given you the privilege, Brother Corliss, go out where you may feel an interest to go out. God will help you, Ellipse. But, oh, excuse me, I know those that have been working hard all their lives, like Elder Loughborough, have a little home. I know those who have been working hard all their lives have a little home. And he, Loughborough, almost wanted to make an apology for it. I find Brother Corliss living in a barn until he can get means to get a little house. We do not oppose that, Brother Corliss. We do not oppose Brother Loughborough for being here. They are the old hands that have helped with their means and with their physical strength and with their mental powers. And we want to say to you, and she quotes John 14, 1 through 3, Let not your heart be troubled. Going on. I, I want to talk about a couple of the two or three of these old hands. The first is John or Corliss. I chose him because you may not know him. Born 1845 to 1923 in Topsom, Maine. Of course, I've mentioned my affinity to Maine, and we have listeners from Maine. He was born in Topsom. He enlisted in the Civil War. He wasn't an Adventist at this time, and after the war, returned to Topsom. Soon his young wife died and was buried in Bath, Maine. After this, he came in contact with the Whites, and James White baptized him in 1868. He became superintendent and chaplain at Battle Creek Health Reform Institute, then a preacher and evangelist. I'm putting all this down so you understand what happens later. And then he went to Australia as a missionary where he helped to establish the Echo Publishing House and became its managing editor. He returned to the U.S. because of health issues. 
and but he is responsible. See, I, I mentioned to you he was an evangelist, and I think I said preacher in the <clears throat> previous slide. He came back to the U.S. because of health issues. The production of Bible readings for the home circle was a major enterprise in the time after he returned. <laughs> I left out. And he adapted his evangelistic topics for publication in this volume. <clears throat> now, if you're familiar with Bible readings for the home, or the home circle as it originally was, you realize it was a monumental work. And it was a work that um, espoused the doctrines of our church at this time. We know Bible readings for the home has been changed in some important areas. But originally, um, it came from the press in good shape. And Corliss, um, the preface to this first edition, and you can read it online, um, it's not in the later editions. I have a 1915 edition here. It's, the preface isn't there. <clears throat> but online, the first edition states, Prominent among the, these contributors, i.e. to this volume, <clears throat> is John Orr Corliss, who assisted by others carefully edited and revised the entire collection, i.e., his notes for evangelism, his sermon notes, that is what was the basis, is the basis for Bible readings for the home. And if you have a volume of this, you know how much information is in there. And so, uh, not everything is from Brother Corliss, but a lot, maybe we could say most. The preface says prominently the um, material is from Corliss. But also, not just his material, of course it's God's material, but his way of organizing and presenting it is in Bible readings for the home circle. But he was the editor for that. And that's a big book where you have to go over everything. He was assisted by others, but that is a major work that he did, and Corliss is behind it. That's what I wanted you to understand about Corliss. You, when you read about him, now you know what he has done <clears throat> for the church, among other things, for us, I should say, for, for the truth. Now, going on, paragraph 13, Ellen White, going back to this manuscript. Now I want to say, that I feel like guarding the old hands in the work. There are a good many things I feel like guarding. I have laid it open that I was to see that the aged ministers were respected. I wish to give my testimony to the point that we must esteem them very highly for their work's sake. Now, I want to tell you that this is repeated to me over and over and over again. God is speaking through Ellen White over and over and over again to respect these old hands. Now all of these pioneers are gone. <clears throat> when she said this, um, it was a sermon she gave at Mountain View, California, January 22, 1905 way before the 1915 meeting in Loma Linda. Uh, Corliss was 60 at this time. Loughborough was um, four days shy of being 73, and Ellen White was 77. So when she said to Corliss, if God is impressing you to go, go. He will, he will help you. She was speaking to a young, younger um, old hands. <laughs> He was only 60. Loughborough was, we can say, 73, and she was 77, for example. Now, so, they're all gone. We are to, they're resting in the grave, I should say, gone temporarily. And we um, have their words to treasure, their words to um, see us through for us to study. Now, I want to tell you also about Loughborough, and hopefully we'll have time for everything here, the dates of his birth and decease, 
John Norton Luthborough was born in Victor, New York. His original name was Luth, L-O-O-F, Burrow. Uh, he never, res and I'm telling you this so that you can respect him more in your mind. He never received a high school education for a school was too far away from his home. He only had a grade school education. But if you know about Loughborough, you know he's written major books. I haven't written a book. He's done, and I've had education, but he, God has blessed him. God blessed Orlis. God blessed, uh, Corliss, sorry. God blessed Loughborough with a good mind and an example of that good mind and the ability to speak and write. He, um, during an organizational meeting on October 5, 1861, <clears throat> Loughborough outlined the five steps of apostasy. We've all probably read and heard about that, in which he noted the formation of a creed as the first or foundation step foundational step, excuse me. And so um, he had a mind, even though it was only educated formally through grade school, he had a mind that God blessed. And God can bless your mind also. We're pretty pitiful here at the end of um, this world's history. We know the time of Jacob's trouble is coming. Hopefully, if if you're like Sister Arlene, maybe. It doesn't matter how old you are when that time comes. It doesn't matter if you are ill. Or, you know, I've said before, I just want to be part of the 144,000. And if I'm on my back in a bed like Leon is, that's okay with me. <laughs> I don't want to be. I'm not asking for that. But I'm saying I just want to be alive when Jesus comes. And, and so um, our minds are pretty pitiful at this stage of human history, yes. But God can still bless them. He can expand them. He can give us what we need uh, for this time. And so I don't remember if I listed those steps. Yes, here it is. Um, from the Review and Herald, October 8, 1861, page 148. And this is in foundation of our faith, and that's why it's fresh in my mind. <clears throat> the first step of apostasy, this is Lothborough speaking, is to get a creed, telling us what we shall believe. The second is to make that creed a test of fellowship. The third is to try members by that creed. The fourth is to denounce as heretics those who do not believe that creed. And fifth, to commence persecution against such. And so that's Loughborough, um, just a little snippet of his life. Luthborough, he was born. Now we're going to move to George Ide Butler. Uh, at age nine, Butler went through the 1844 disappointment with his family. He was converted at age 22. Uh, and this information I'm not quoting, but I get gleaned from the Seventh-day Adventist Encyclopedia, so I'm giving credit to that. But um, he was converted at the age of 22 through the efforts of J.N. Andrews. In 1871, he was elected as president of the GC. He was active in raising funds for the first college at Battle Creek, Michigan, and in establishing Pacific Press in Oakland, California in 1874. He served a second time as president of the General Conference from 1880 to 1888. And, uh, of course, we know the great divide that occurred in 1888. And I have some information I want to share about Butler during that period of time. But before I do that, I have this quote um, from Review and Herald Supplement, 1883, where he speaks highly of the, uh, the visions of Ellen White. He states this, The majority of our people believe these visions to be genuine manifestations of spiritual gifts and as such to be entitled 
to respect. We do not hold them superior to the Bible or, in one sense, equal to it. The scriptures are our rule to test everything by, the visions as well as other things. That rule, therefore, is of the highest authority. The standard is higher than the thing tested by it. If the Bible should show the visions were not in harmony with it, the Bible would stand and the visions would be given up. He was addressing those who had been uh, criticizing the visions of Ellen White. But something came up in 1888. And here's the link for that supplement. I had to search and search to find that supplement. So I'm giving you the link. And you'll see in the link um, dash V60 dash 33 S. That stands for supplement, and that was the key letter that threw everything off for me, and in, in the um, Adventist archives. And that's why, brothers and sisters, we try to be so careful with um, the references, because if you ever want to look them up, we can't just say Review and Herald 19. 21 or whatever. We have to give you all the information. Otherwise, you may not find it based on my history going on. Now, Butler. At the 1888 General Conference session, Butler opposed the message of righteousness by faith presented by Jones and Wagner. Butler was ill at the time and didn't attend, but he sent a 39-page letter blaming his illness, in part, on Ellen White's opposition to him. Five years later, 1893, he wrote a letter of confession that he had been wrong. It was published in the Review of June 13, 1893, and 17 years later, he was at Loma Linda for the Biennial Conference in 1915. So that just gives you a little history, brothers and sisters of some of our pioneer leaders. And here's Butler, who for five years opposed the message of righteousness by faith, even in part blaming Ellen White for his illness. But God spoke to his heart. It took five years, but he wrote a letter of confession and um, stating he was wrong. And that may be the last of our slides. So, that's just a little background, a little history of some of these old hands that Ellen White says she has heard over and over and over, um, um, spoken to her or in vision or whatever, to respect these old hands. And that going along with that is to take care of them. Um, Loughborough, no, yes, was it Loughborough? One of the two, Corliss or Loughborough, was living in a barn. It was Corliss until he had funds, could raise funds to find a home. They had given everything to the work, brothers and sisters. All right, now, not just uh, of their physical ability, yes, that's important. Of their financial means, yes, that's important. Of their mental energy, yes, that's important too. Thrones of Worship. Now, last time, in the time before, uh, the focus was on the splitting of the monarchy into the tribes of Israel and the tribes of, tribe of Judah, which included Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin, and uh, the kings and their thrones, and how Jeroboam was fearful he would lose his throne, and so he established two places of worship with a, um, a bull calf to worship. We've went through all, gone through all that. Excuse me, I hear it so much in West Virginia. We have gone through all of that, and um, last week we introduced the throne of Satan. And why I'm at slide twelve? I'm going to have to back up. And now we're going to pick up there, and I think I brought in Josiah. And Huldah spoke to Josiah uh, that Jerusalem's ruin, this is many uh, centuries or years later, centuries, and 
Review and Herald, July 29, 1915, paragraph 1, Ellen White um, states, and she's quoting here, Tell the man that sent you to me, the prophet is declared, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil against this place, upon this place, and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah hath read, because they have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods. We're going to talk about this incense. That they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. So we're going to go on because I'm just running out of time. And uh, so Josiah humbled his heart. Uh, you'll have to read about that. We're going to skip the Josiah part so that we can get to the important part of God's throne. God's throne on high. Desire of Ages mentions Elijah, not for him the descent into the dust of death, but the ascent in glory with the convoy of celestial chariots, not just his, a convoy of chariots taking him to the throne on high. Also, Desire of Ages 493.2, the rainbow of promise encircling the throne on high is an everlasting testimony that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We'll move on. Revelation 4, 2-3, and immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight, like unto an er emerald. And then we know, of course, Daniel 7 speaks of thrones. I beheld till the thrones were cast down. Ca that casting down means placed, put into position. And the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head. Here, there's, here's another description of this Ancient of Days. Um, his head like the pure wool, his throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as a burning fire, fiery stream issued. We're going to move on. Great Controversy 4.15.2 In the temple in heaven, the dwelling place of God, his throne is established in righteousness and judgment. That's significant sentence in the throne in heaven the dwelling place of God now we don't know I, I'm not ready to expound on whether the antecedent to the dwelling place of God is heaven or the temple but she states in the temple in heaven the dwelling place of God most likely it's temple is the antecedent. His throne is established in righteousness and judgment. But there are, Ellen White saw in vision, two companies before this throne. And now I'm going to quote to you from Broadside. She wrote of her vision, and it was printed in Broadside. Later in um, early writings, you'll find similar and, and very often uh, the same wording. Um, about what happened, but he, I'm quoting the earliest one, April 6, 1846, starting paragraph 7. In February 1845, I had a vision of events commencing with the midnight cry. I hope you understand what the midnight cry is. It's the cry, the bridegroom cometh, go you out, go ye out to meet him. And, uh, and this is what was occurring just before 1844, uh, the disappointment in 1844. I saw a throne, she goes on to say, and on it sat the Father and the Son. I gazed on Jesus' countenance and admired his lovely person. The Father's person I could not behold, for a cloud of glorious light covered him. We're going to go on. You can, I'll unlock the slides for you. Going on, before the throne, I saw the Advent people, comma, the church, comma, and the world. 
I saw a company bowed down before the throne, deeply interested, while most of them stood up disinterested and careless. Those who were bowed before the throne would offer up their prayers and look to Jesus, and then he would look to the Father and appear to be pleading with him. A light would come from the Father to the Son and from the Son to the praying company. Things to remember here is a smaller company was bowed before the throne. But most of the people in this group stood up and were careless and not interested. But those who bowed before the throne offered up their prayers and were received light from the Father through Jesus. Going on. Then I saw an exceeding bright light come from the Father to the Son, and from the Son it waved over the people before the throne. The people, not just those bowed the people before the throne, but few would receive this great light. Many came out from under it and immediately resisted it. Others were careless and did not cherish the light, and it moved off them. Brothers and sisters, let's not be careless and not cherish the light, because it could move off of us too. But nevertheless, at this time, it moved off with them. Some cherished it in this group, great group and went and bowed down with the little praying company. This company all received the light and rejoiced in it as their countenances shone with its glory. And I saw the Father rise from the throne and in a flaming chariot go into the Holy of Holies within the veil and did sit. Do you understand the... Um, the scene going on here and where this is taking place and when. And then, uh, excuse me, there I saw thrones I had never seen before. Then Jesus rose up from the throne and the most of those who were bowed down arose with him. And I did not see one ray of light pass from Jesus to the careless multitude after he arose and they were left in perfect darkness. Those who rose up when Jesus did kept their eyes fixed on him. He left the throne and led them out a little way. Then he raised his right arm and we heard his lovely voice saying, and I just had to break it here. The paragraph was too long, but before we go to the completion of the paragraph, um, Jesus rose up, we read, from the throne and... Um, most of those who were bowed, not all brothers and sisters, even at this point, not all followed Jesus. But the group that followed Jesus kept their eyes fixed on him, and he said to them, Wait here. I'm going to my Father to receive the kingdom. Keep your garments spotless. And in a little while, I will return from the wedding and receive you to myself. And I saw a cloudy chariot with wheels like flaming fire and angels were all around it as it came where Jesus was. He stepped into the chariot and was born to the holiest where the Father sat. <clears throat> there I beheld Jesus as he was standing before the Father, a great high priest. On the hem of his garment was a bell and, a pome and pomegranate. Then Jesus showed me the difference between faith and and feeling. And I don't see a list of people, but I'm hoping Thomas' family is still there because I just want to talk about this for a minute. At this time, Ellen White um, had revealed to her the difference between faith and feeling. She doesn't say what it is. She doesn't expand on it. Maybe later in other places, Pastor expanded on it a little bit just a little while ago. <clears throat> but there's something I want to add to everyone's thoughts. And it's not um, complete and conclusive. It's just something else to consider. And that is, yes, Brother Thomas, intellectually I know there is no other way than God's way. I know that. 
And so intellectually, our faith is intellectual. It's not just some vague kind of a thing, something that we feel, but intellectually we know it. We know these truths. We know there is no other way. <clears throat> okay. But also, uh, I want you to consider, for example, sometimes every one of us has been in the pit of despair. I can't say I don't know you, but I just know this is the human condition that Satan is trying. One of his devices <laughs> is to bring this despondency, to bring, to bring um, despair, depression, confusion, the um, thought, I might as well just give up. What use? I don't know what to do. So we have these feelings. <clears throat> Maybe you've been diagnosed with a terrible disease. Maybe you have <clears throat> injured yourself know, and know that, how can I possibly go on because I have this to do and that to do and I can't do it. And I don't know the answer, but that's when faith steps in and you know that God knows. God has the answer. So my faith, regardless of how low I feel, regardless how bad I feel physically, regardless of how dark it seems mentally around me, my faith is there in a risen Lord in a Savior that is pleading my case before the Ancient of Days. And that's true for each one of us. And so, <clears throat> our faith pierces the darkness that Satan throws upon us, or is allowed to throw upon us. And we all we need to do is plead, Jesus, help me. And that prayer never goes unanswered. You might be, during the time of Jacob's trouble, in an isolated place, in a cell. You know, brothers and sisters, I just want to tell you that for the last two years, I've um, cared for my husband 24-7. I have a home. I have the country. I can walk around outside when I know he's safe and secure. He's always safe and secure, praise God. But when I know he's not coughing or I don't have to worry about, oh, there he goes, don't have to worry about anything, I can walk outside in the sunshine, walk over here, walk over there. So I'm not in a cell, but I am homebound. And once in a while I can drive to town to pick up curbside groceries. So I do get out. I have nothing to complain about. But two years being homebound, <clears throat> puts a, um, a, a burden on a person. and But that is nothing compared to being in a cell, a cell maybe nine by nine or whatever it is. And so, <clears throat> I don't know how I got on this topic, how did it connect, but nevertheless, we can be in, in this kind of heavy burden or darkness but our faith pierces through that. And we know, we can mentally see our God on His throne and our Savior interceding for us. And, and that's all that matters. It, this, this little world we live in will all work out one day going on. So that's my adding to faith and feeling. <clears throat> Ellen White goes on to say, And I saw those who rose up with, G with Jesus send their faith to him in the holiest and pray, My Father, give us thy spirit. Then Jesus would breathe upon them the Holy Ghost. In the breath was light, power, and much love, joy, and peace. Then I turned to look at the company who were still bowed before the throne. That's the company that did not get up and follow Jesus out. Um, Satan appeared to be by the throne trying to carry on the work of God. 
I, I saw them look up to the throne and pray, My Father, give us thy spirit, then Satan would breathe upon them an unholy power, an uh, unholy influence. In it was light and much power, but no sweet love, joy, and peace. Satan's object was to keep them deceived and to draw back and deceive God's children. I saw one after another leave the company who were praying to Jesus in the holiest and go to join them before the throne, and they at once received the unholy influence of Satan. There is a shaking going on brothers and sisters, a sifting, and even those of us who might uh, be praying to our Heavenly Father, knowing that the investigative judgment is going on, and knowing that Christ is our uh, great high priest, even some of those people will get up and leave we just read it going on. May it not be any one of us, please. So, we have a great high priest pleading our case. We know not when. And brothers and sisters, the point I want to bring out about this um, exceeding bright light of the midnight cry and the people, not everyone of course, accepting it. You know what they were doing? They were doing everything to cleanse themselves of sin, to be ready to meet Jesus in the clouds. It's true, they were all greatly disappointed. But before that disappointment, they believed Jesus was coming. And they weren't going to sit back in a chair and wait for him. They were getting ready and their countenances shone with the glory of God because God was working a miracle in their lives. And that's, brothers and sisters, where we need to be, this little praying company acknowledging Jesus in the most holy place before the Ancient of Days who makes the decision of our cases and also pleading, My blood, Father, my blood, my blood. And you know what happened then? Another great light. And the angels were stopped from ending things, from withdrawing because the people of God were not sealed. And that's where we are right now, in the sealing time. And we know not how much longer it's going to last. And so, during this time, our great high priest is uh, interceding for us. And I want to tell you that at this great, you know, we saw this picture of the altar of incense with the in, before the curtain dividing the holy place from the most holy place is this altar of incense. And this incense is, ascends up and over into the most holy place. And Ellen White, in, um, here in Great Controversy, talks about our prayers ascending too, mixed in with this incense, this symbolic incense that goes up um, into the most, over into the most holy place. I want to tell you what that incense is. And this is important. Uh, and, she, and this is just one place, Messages to Young People, 95.4. As they pray, you and me, people, God's people, he mingles with their prayers the incense of his righteousness and offers them, i.e. the prayers mixed with his righteousness, to God as a fragrant sacrifice in his strength, in his strength, the youth can endure hardness as good soldiers of the cross. Strengthened with his might, they are enabled to reach the high ideals before them. The sacrifice made on Calvary is the pledge of their victory. The important part is he mingles with their prayers the incense of his righteousness. And then the next several slides, the next um, four slides, five slides, are about the Sabbath. 
in meeting with God on the Sabbath, you see, we meet with him, or he meets with us, shall I say. Um, how can we boldly say we meet with him? But he, he meets with us, those of a pure and humble heart, those who are cooperating with heaven to be ready when Jesus comes. And if we read, let's just look for a minute at Revelation 18, verse 1. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory, saying, Babylon, the great is fallen. And uh, verse 4, I heard another voice come from heaven, saying, from heaven, saying, Come out of her, my people. And... Um, it goes on. Uh, you see, when we come out of this device of Satan where error is preached, I'm sorry to have to say that. I'm not saying the people in the denomination are um, bad. God knows their hearts. But the system is wrong. The system is bad, just like the system of the papacy is bad, because it teaches error. The main one we think of is the Trinity. And I can't spend time on that. But um, as we prepare for the time of Jacob's trouble, and we know that time only comes after the close of probation and we are sealed, so we have to be cleansed of our sin. There is no other way, brothers and sisters. Our, you see, we stand up, we follow Jesus into the most holy place, and um, we pray, and God sends light to us. And our faces, those faces that you saw, were full of the glory of God. So will ours. Maybe no one else can see it, but... Maybe you and me, other brothers and sisters, the world won't, will trample upon it. It will not be worth anything to them. But because we have made ourselves ready through the power of God, we've laid everything before him and said, Father, cleanse me of my sin. And our love for God you see, will be more than an intellectual love. Yes, we know this is truth. We are grounded and firmly um, standing upon truth. But what you have done for us is so magnificent. It's something we could never, ever do. We are doomed without you. And that makes us love him with a love that only comes from God. And he loves us so much that he gave his son. Of course, we know that. He loves the whole universe. But his focus is right here on you and on me. And we may not know what to do. We may be in a, um, a darkness that is overwhelming, or we may be cherishing sin that we just love. But God will help flatline that desire of any sin. It can always be there. We can pick it up and follow it. But he will flatline that desire, that sinful cherishing, if we let him. And it's to him that all glory and honor go. I'm going to close there. I'll unlock the slides if I can get to them because I know I jumped over different portions. May God bless you, brothers and sisters. We're all here together at this time because God wants us to be a little flock, even though we're separated, even though we may not ever see each other until... We assemble around that great white throne. But may we be faithful, I ask. Let's close with prayer. Father, we do thank you for your great love for us. 
where would we be without it? We would be in an apocalypse of evil that we cannot fathom. But because of your greatness and goodness and your power, you protect us, you guide us, and in the process give us love, joy, and peace, and we thank you for all of that. Please be with each one. May our steps be firm to follow you, and not even at this point to walk away from this great truth you've given us. Whatever burden we're carrying, Lord, whatever indecision, whatever health issue, whatever is dragging us down, may we rest in your arms knowing that you will lift us up and care for us always, moment by moment. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Till we meet again, may God watch between us. Bye for now. Thank you.